Hello, my name's Danny Hopkins and I'm here at Britpart in Shropshire to talk to you about this beast, the Discovery 3. Now in 2004, Land Rover took the bold move of taking its Discovery away from the original sector, so no longer such a utilitarian vehicle beloved of farmers, and they stuck the Discovery 3 firmly into the luxury MPV sector. Now there was a bewildering array of different specifications, there still are. There are also some really important things that you need to know if you want to buy one just for you, because if you buy a bad one, it will be a world of pain. Buy a good one, best car you've ever owned. So to take you through it, here's Martin. Okay, so as Danny said, the Discovery 3 is quite a complex car and there's a lot to look out for when you're buying one. The model was launched in 2004 and ran to 2009 when it was replaced by the Discovery 4. When it first came out, there were three trim levels, which were S, SE and HSE, HSE being the top spec. S was dropped in 2006 and replaced with GS and XS. There was also two engine choices when the car first came out, one being a 4.4 litre petrol V8, which are now quite thin on the ground, you're much more likely to come across the 2.7 TD V6 diesel. Manual was standard on the cars, but a lot of people specified the automatic gearbox, which is generally a better choice for everyday use. And in 2008, the car also re received a number of upgrades from Land Rover, including body coloured bumpers, wheel arch trims, and a number of interior revisions. So now let's head out onto the road and we'll show you what to look for when you test drive one. So the first thing you want to do when you're test driving a Discovery is have a good look at the interior just to see how it's been treated. Obviously these were popular family cars so there's possibility there could be marks and scuffs on the door cards. Any rips and tears in the seats should be taken into account. The S model came with cloth as standard but the SE and HSE models had leather like this one and Nappa leather was also an option on the later models which was much softer to the feel and not, not as grainy to look at. The SE and HSE also had a touchscreen sat-nav as standard. Now it's worth bearing in mind that map upgrades are available but they are quite expensive and they end in 2015 so the very latest ones aren't compatible with this system. As you're driving the car, if you've got a manual gearbox it's worth making note of where the clutch bite point is because if it's quite high it's possible that the car might need a clutch replacement in the near future and that can be an expensive job because the dual mass flywheel can need replacing at the same time. When you're driving the automatics, make sure it shifts between drive, sport and up and down as it should. And also watch the rev counter as you accelerate to see if there's any slipping, flaring or shuddering as you accelerate through the rev range because that can be an indication of skipped oil changes. Also while you're driving, when you're going over rough ground or bumps or speed humps, listen for any knocks or clonks from the suspension because that can give you an indication that there's a loose or worn ball joint or bush. Uh, as we mentioned before, these cars are quite heavy on bushes and ball joints because they're such a heavy car and they do knock out the front lower arm bushes and the top rear arm bushes. So check out the other videos in the Britpart Workshop series where we actually replace those arms and show you how to do it. SE and HSE models will have had sunroofs and there was a bit of a problem with the drain tubes when these cars were new that what would happen is the valve in the end of the drain tube would become clogged with dirt, leaves, any sort of rubbish and the water would back up the tube and leak into the interior through the sunroof. Obviously having so many electronics in this car any water in the interior that's mixing with those electrics is going to cause problems so ask the seller if there's ever been any problems with water ingress, uh, check the carpets aren't damp, things like that. Other than that, the sunroofs are pretty reliable. On the higher spec cars, there's a lot of things inside the cabin to test. Uh, they have electrically adjustable seats, so you need to make sure all the switches work. Make sure all the electric windows, electric mirrors, everything like that works, as well as the entertainment system, the air conditioning, climate control, uh, heated seats, heated windscreens, everything like that should be in operating condition. Uh, if the aircon doesn't blow cold and the vehicle's got rear air conditioning fitted, it's probable that the pipes that run below the vehicle are corroded and they're really expensive and tricky to replace so take that into consideration if the vehicle does have rear air conditioning. Another thing to check while you're out driving the Discovery is if you get to a nice open piece of road put the gearbox in sport mode and really accelerate hard look in the mirror to make sure there's no excessive black smoke as it pulls through the rev range 
if there is a lot of smoke or it feels like the car lacks power, it's possible that there's a boost problem or you could have a sticking EGR valve, so take that into consideration. Right, so if you park up on a nice quiet piece of road, you can test all the off-road functions of the vehicle. So if you select neutral on your automatic and go from high range into low range, it should tell you that you've selected low range on the dashboard and the little green light with the mountains will come on. Go back to high range. It will say high range selected. You should hear a click from the transfer box as that selects. The next thing to do is to check the air suspension so you can select extended height and the vehicle will raise. Select access mode and the vehicle will lower. So when you select normal height, it should settle back to that height fairly quickly. If it does take longer than you'd expect, then there's a possibility that the air suspension compressor is getting tired and may need replacing. So next, we can check all the terrain response functions. So normal driving, you would have it in normal mode. You've got ice and snow, mud and ruts, sand mode, and rock crawl. So make sure when you select each one, it should flash for a couple of seconds and then go solid. Uh, some ranges you do need to have low range selected for it to engage. So just make sure everything on the terrain response works as it should. Finally, we can check the hill descent control. Press the hill descent control switch and the emblem will come up on the dashboard. You can then select drive, let your foot off the brake. And if you're on a descent, you should feel the car break itself down the hill automatically. As you can hear, the ABS pump working, letting the vehicle descend the hill slowly and in a controlled manner. So when you've checked that that works, press the button again to disengage it and you can drive off normally. So here we are under the bonnet of the Discovery. There's the 2.7 TDV6 engine. This is generally a good engine. It has its quirks and its foibles like most modern diesels. Uh, it's especially important that this engine's serviced on time because they are very sensitive to having their oil changed at the correct period. Um, other things to look out for are the EGR valves. When you start the vehicle, listen for a ticking noise. Uh, if that noise continues and the, the, there's black smoke from the exhaust and any lack of power, there's a possibility one of the EGR valves is failing. If you get a chirping or a squealing noise at idle, that means it's possible that the auxiliary belt tensioner is failing, the bearing inside is breaking up and just causing a bit of noise, but they're not too difficult to change. Another thing to check under the bonnet is to make sure that the vehicle has the correct battery fitted. Being quite complex cars, it's really important that they have a battery fitted that's up to the job. So look for a genuine battery or either a 950 cold cranking amps rating or an absorbed glass mat like this one. We move over to the other side. The Discovery had 11 recalls throughout its lifetime. One of those recalls was on the braking vacuum system. So make sure the car has this brake pipe fitted here. Um, this was an extension piece that was fitted under warranty uh, for a problem that meant that the vacuum pump would leak oil into the master cylinder. So just check the color of the brake fluid in there, make sure it's not too dark. Again, that should, be that should be replaced every three years on service anyway. Another thing that's worth checking is the turbo pipes, because if they crack or get contaminated with oil and split, then you'll have a, lower, a lack of boost pressure and you'll get smoke from the exhaust and a lack of power when you're driving the car. So spend a few moments just looking over these to make sure they're not oily, there's no cracking in the rubber and they haven't got any big splits in. It's also important to check that the timing belt and the fuel pump belt have been replaced on time. They are due to be changed every seven years or 105,000 miles, whichever comes soonest. And obviously it's quite an important and a large service. So if the car's coming up for that service, you'll have to budget for that. Another thing to note is these do like to throw on warning lights and there's a lot of them. So if you have a bit of a nervous disposition about warning lights, Discovery 3 probably isn't for you. Luckily, there's a huge range of quality parts available from Britpart to keep one of these on the road. So now we're gonna put it up in the air and show you what you need to check for underneath. Okay, so we're underneath the vehicle. The first thing to check, if you're starting at the back, is the tow bar. There's a massive service action on these. 
uh, from people leaving the detachable tow bars in place and corrosion setting in between the tow bar and the cross member. So if it is in place, give it a good shake, make sure it's not loose and just visually check the cross member, make sure there's no rot setting in. Moving further forward, make sure the spare wheel is in place because these were really easy to steal and a lot of the full size alloys went missing over the period of time. So make sure that's in place and that the winch is holding it in place securely. Uh, you can expect some surface corrosion on the chassis. Um, it shouldn't be excessive, but just give anything that looks suspicious a bit of a poke with a screwdriver, make sure it doesn't hole. Uh, obviously, depending on where the car's been in the country will depend on how rusty it is. And another thing to look out for on the rust side of things is the brake pipes. The rear brake pipes that run from the front of the car along the body and out to the rear wheels corrode readily and they're an absolute nightmare to change in situ. So if yours look rusty, budget for that accordingly. Moving further forward, just check the exhausts in good condition. Obviously, if these vehicles have been used off-road, then inspect them underneath for any damage, signs of scrapes and knocks. Also, make sure the air suspension compressor hasn't been jacked up on, because a lot of people mistake it for a jacking point. Uh, the bracket that holds it to the chassis is only made of aluminium, so if there's been a trolley jack under there and the bracket snapped off, the compressor will vibrate against the chassis and make a horrible noise, so make sure that all looks okay. So again, vehicles that have got rear air conditioning fitted will have a pair of silver pipes running along this sill, and if there's any discoloration or moisture around any of the joins, you can suspect there's probably a leak in the aircon system. A little bit of misting on the transfer box isn't uncommon, but make sure it isn't pouring out. Get hold of the prop shaft and have a look at the centre bearing if you can while you give it a shake. The rubbers often split on these and cause a vibration. So make sure that's in good condition. Moving forward again, make sure there's not excessive oil on either of the under trays. Uh, if there's an engine oil leak, it will track all the way down and you'll see a lot of moisture at the back of this metal one here. Check the CV boots are in good condition, haven't sprayed all their grease out. That will be an MOT failure and it will cause the drive shafts to run dry and eventually fail. Just go over everything, make sure the ball joints look in good condition. They haven't got any split boots uh, on the lower ball joint, on the tie rod gaiters on the front. Um, just make sure everything looks free of damage. Another thing to check is if you can jack the vehicle up, give the tyres a spin, give the wheels a spin, make sure there's no damage to the inside of the wheels, no splits in the sidewalls, because tyres for these vehicles are quite expensive. And once you finish doing that, you can give each wheel a little wiggle just to check for any play in the lower ball joints. Get, get hold of each wheel, give it a shake side to side to see if there's any play in the wheel bearings, any play in the track rod ends and the tie rods themselves. And then the very last thing to look for at the front of the car, just check the underside of the front bumper and the under trays for any dents and scrapes and marks from off-road use because that will give you a good indication of how the vehicle's been treated. So the Discovery 3 is a great car. If you pick a good one, it will serve you well. And all the parts are available from Britpart to keep one of these on the road, no problem at all. So if you want to check out more videos on Land Rovers and how to keep them on the road, have a look at the other videos in the Britpart Workshop series.